Hey, what's up? I got some more lore content for you guys. Alongside my recent three decks for beginners video, I also wanted to provide some more easy to craft decks for newer and intermediate players. I'll be covering each region one after another, that way you have a direction to go based on your favorite region. Hello, my name is Tempo and I've hit master tier every season since the beta, even peaking rank 1 multiple times on the North American ladder, and I will be your guide to Legends of Runeterra. So small disclaimer before I get into the first one, these decks won't be able to be crafted day 1. These are primarily meant as solid cores to go for after a few weeks of playing and understanding which regions or playstyles you enjoy the most. If you want the easiest and most budget decks to craft, I recommend checking out my 3 decks for beginners video from a few weeks ago. And now we're heading to Shurima. And for the first deck we'll be using the only ascended Shuriman that we start with and that is Nasus. We're going to pair him up with Callista which is one of the tutorial decks. So this is going to be a very easy deck to craft for the most part. I'm pretty sure it's all commons and rares and I think you even start with one or two undying. I don't quite remember. But this is the only epic that's required and the rest of the deck is pretty easy to craft on top of the fact that it is just a refined version of the tutorial deck. The main theme of the deck is actually to lean into the aggressive side of things, especially with the fearsome keyword that is shared between Shadow Isles and Shurima. We're going to be utilizing those and trying to push damage and using our direct kill spells to kind of whittle down the opponent's board while we're pushing our big dudes forward. And starting us off, we have Bakai Reaper, who is a 1-mana one 1-2 one with Fearsome. Fearsome says can only be blocked by enemies with 3 or more power. So if the opponent isn't playing a bunch of, like, uh, bigger dudes, we're going to be able to get cheesy attack damage in with Bakai Reaper, and he also ramps an attack. It says, when you slay a unit, grant me 1-0. Slay applies if you kill an opponent's unit during combat, but it also applies through spells, and it counts for your allies as well if you do kill spells. Next we have Burgeoning Sentinel, which is another 1-mana one 1-2 one Fearsome. She says, the first time you kill a unit with a spell, grant me plus 2 plus 1. This can be our own unit, or it can be an opponent's unit. So as long as we kill a unit with a spell, she'll be a 1-mana 3-3 three, three with Fearsome, which is just a really strong card to try to play around early. Next we have Cease of Sentry, 2-mana two 2-1, two last breath, draw 1. This is a great card to get down as just an early attacker and blocker against the opponent's strategy, whatever they're trying to play, and also as a good target for our kill spells. We want to do things like Hate Spike and Death Grasp, which we'll talk about shortly, which targets an ally and it kills it to do a negative effect to the opponent's unit, usually direct damage. So we're going to be using Cease of Sentry as a target for that, that way we get a bonus draw while also removing an opponent's unit. And here is Fading Icon, 2 mana 3 1, when I'm summoned, summon a prey, so it's a really nice attacker and blocker by itself. However, we also get this free 0 1 token. Just like the Cease of Sentry, we're going to be using this as a target for our kill spells. And speaking of which, we have one right here, 2 mana fast speed spell, Glimpse Beyond, this is a Shadow Walls classic, kill an ally to draw 2. We can use this on our token to get more resources if the opponent taps out, but for the most part we want to save Glimpse Beyond as a reaction to something the opponent does. Because of the way the spell stack works in the game and spells resolve backwards, we actually want to use Glimpse, you know, when something is already dying. That way we can kill it first and get a plus two out of it. And next we have Hate Spike. This is one of our bread and butter kill spells. Two mana fast speed. Kill an ally to deal three to a unit and summon a random husk. So we're going to be able to shoot something for three, which is super good. And we also get a husk for later. Husk is a zero one unit that has a keyword attached to it. And if we play a unit later, it will eat the husk, gaining the plus one uh, HP and also the keyword, whichever one it has. So that's a really nice like little synergy too. We can make our further units like more tanky and also give them an extra keyword, which is super nice for like our champions like Callista. So super good card overall. Next we have Buru Sentinel, 3 mana 3-3 three, three with Fearsome. The first time you kill a unit with a spell, grant me plus 2 plus 1, just like the other Sentinel, same effect. He will become a 3 mana 5-4. Super tanky, super strong, again with Fearsome, kind of makes it hard for the opponent to block, and he can get a bunch of damage in that way. Next we have Death Grasp, this is another kill spell, 3 mana fast speed, kill an ally to deal 5 to a unit, so in case something just like does not die to the 3 damage one, well hey, now we have Death Grasp to deal up to 5, and that's going to hit a lot of early and mid game champions, so Death Grasp should just come in and try to slow down the opponent's strategy, again while you keep furthering yours, getting your fearsome procs going, getting your additional attack and HP, and you should just be pretty happy playing a more like uh, middle of the road playstyle. There's a lot of aggression in the deck, but there's also times where you can slow down and use removal accordingly and try to get ahead that way. And I think that's super cool. Next, we have Callista, three mana, three, four with Fearsome. Of course, we love that keyword. She levels up if she's seen three plus allies die. We can be doing this a lot through combat or our own kill spells, and then we can level up Callista. 
Level 2 Kalissa says, each round, the first time I attack, revive an attacking ephemeral copy of the strongest dead allied follower. So it picks a follower in grave that has the highest attack, and it attacks with you. This round we're bonded and it takes damage from me, which makes it hard to block Callista. So if someone tries to put up a uh, fearsome blocker on Callista, the ghost will take the damage instead and Callista will remain at full HP. So that's really nice just to give you extra attack pressure and it's something else the opponent has to worry about. Next we have another fearsome attacker, of course, 3 mana 4, 2, Merciless Hunter. Play grant an enemy vulnerable. Vulnerable is really nice because you can start uh, targeting like, let's say elusives or something like that, you know, like these Teemos and stuff running around that are just kind of annoying. You can give it vulnerable and then attack it. Something else you can do is vulnerable a fearsome blocker and then attack with your weakest thing and grab it. That way your other high attack fearsome attackers get to go in and push direct damage. So you get to manipulate combat in your favor and maybe even get some cheesy lethals with it. Next we have Undying. Undying is a really good engine for this deck. It is a self-reoccurring, resurrecting target for our kill spells. It starts as a 3 mana 2 2 that cannot block. Last breath revive me at the next round start and grant me plus 1 plus 1 for each time I've died. So every time you kill off the undying it's going to come back even stronger. And again it's a fantastic target for things like hate spike, death grass, glimpse beyond. Just has a lot of innate synergy with the deck so super super good. Next we have Camivoran Dragon. Speaking of which, this is a really cool card as well. 4 mana 4-4, four, four, Fearsome of course, and Fury whenever it kills a unit grant at 1-1. This includes its on play effect, so we're going to be reading that. To play me, I strike an ally, or you can also deal 3 damage to your nexus in case you don't have an ally I suppose. Um, when I kill another unit, drain one from the enemy nexus. So what we want to do is set up Undying, and then do Camivoran Dragon which will kill the Undying. Camivoran will gain 1-1. One, one, and also drain one from the enemy nexus, and your undying will come back stronger the next turn. So just honestly, really cool synergy. Really strong turn three into turn four play. And if you have multiple Camivore dragons, you can actually just win through them. Like it's so much pressure. Really, really strong card. It's gonna come in as a four mana five five that has fearsome and has drained one. So really, really sick. Next, we have a new card actually. It's a four mana three four with fearsome. Love that keyword. When I'm summoned or you summon a titanic ally, curse the strongest enemy with terror. Terra says while I'm in hand the curse unit has minus three. So we get to apply a minus three debuff to the strongest enemy. And that's really nice because it might put them below fearsome blocking range so we can get better swings. Also, if you summon um, Nasus later because he ramps up, then you get more terrors. But for the most part, we just want the four mana three four body that curses on play. Just really, really good. A little side note is not only is it on play, but it's also on summon. So like, let's say for example, Deathgrass Cultist somehow is the strongest a uh, card in your graveyard, Callista level 2 will revive this, giving you like basically a burst speed terror. And that's really cool. I'm very curious to see how often we can pull off that kind of combo, but it does seem super sick. And to round us out, we have Nasus, our other champion. He is also fearsome, of course. I have plus one, plus one for each unit you've slain this game, so he's not just a 3-3. Three, three. He's going to go up to like 10-10, which is exactly where you want him because he levels up if he strikes for 10 damage in a singular strike. And then he becomes Super Saiyan Nasus. He gets spell shield, makes him harder to deal with, and enemies have minus one attack so that your fearsome attackers can reliably hit more. Some other cards to consider, you could get in Rekindler if you want to play a bit slower of course and have some resurrections for your Callista and your Nasus. Super good. You can also come up with like this really weird combo where Rekindler is the strongest thing in your graveyard and then uh, Callista will summon him and then he'll summon like another Callista if she's died earlier and then you just have like a pseudo infinite which is really funny so that's just a good card in general. You can also slow the deck down and play more like single target removal cards like you can play Quietus. That's pretty good. You can play Soul Harvest. That's a pretty good card. You can play Vengeance. That's also pretty cool. So if you just want to play more controlled, hey, we can put Avenging Vestaya in here and have Riot Negation too. Speaking of which, we can run Rite of Negation if you do have the epics. You can run Quicksand, which is a good card because it makes it harder for the opponent to block when you lower their attack, right? And then they, they're not fearsome blockers anymore. Lots of good options here, basically. Even Wings and Wave can come in. This is another epic. I wanted to exclude it because it's really expensive, but this is like the super budget version, of course. You can fit Wings and Wave in here, too. And that's it for the deck rundown. Now, here's a live commentary game so you can see how the deck plays out. I'll be giving context to why I'm playing certain cards, and hopefully it gives you a good feel on how to play the deck. And for this example game, we're fighting Shivana Elder Dragon, one of the best decks in the entire meta, so if we can beat it, then our deck is just the best deck that's ever existed, and that's all there is to it. So we have Sentry on 2, we have Callista on attack 3, um, I don't know about keeping no Nasus, I don't think we need Nasus. Let's go ahead and keep 1 Sentry, 1 Callista, and just try to get some of our removal spells. We'll draw into Nasus later. Surely. 
surely we'll draw into him when we need him. So we have no one drop. That is okay. For the most part, floating the first couple turns is pretty fine. Because we need to use Spellman at some point anyways. Allegiant? Yeah. Let's go and play Fading Icon. And then we'll do Callista on attack 3. That should be good into everything they develop, except for exactly blocking Badger Bear. We'll show top that Callista too. Swing, swing. We never attack with our token. We want to hold that back so we can use it to target for spells. Go ahead and take that trade. That's one for Callista. She gets the swing in there. Looks good. I'm kind of down to just Kim of Orin right away, too. It's not terrible. Ah, oh, see? We got our Nasus back. Nice. Shivana. Kim of Orin Dragon targeting 0 1. That's kill an ally. That's now a 5 5 Dragon. Close to that 2 of 3. Shivana can't even attack this turn. Ain't no way. You think they have form up? They could have form up. Okay, nope. We're good. We are good. Akai Reaper. Guru Sentinel. Glimpse. That sounds pretty nice. Stupid Kai Reaper, and then Buru, and then Glimpse. Screeching Dragon's fine. And then we want to do Kimborin, Buru, Akai, and Callista on the far right, because I think something's going to die during combat, and Callista's going to gain extra stats, which is super good. Look at all this fearsome damage, though. If they try like something like single combat, then I'll also do Glimpse as a response. No, that's it. That's it. It's all you're sending. Ah, oh, I see. Let's see, that's pretty good. What if I do Glimpse here? I get to keep Callista. She lives with one. I draw two. I get the extra bonus on the five four. It's a pretty interesting way to use Glimpse Beyond, to be honest, for the uh, Callista level. Yeah, pretty nifty, and we get extra damage in this way too, because we get a uh, plus two attack here. And we get to draw more, so hey. We just want to make sure we stay nice and aggressive, always swinging here. Got them down to 6. Got them down to 6 HP already. But now they're in uh, turn 6, which means their turn 6 onwards units are going to get the boons from the Elder. So it's going to be a little bit harder to play into. Yeah, that's one of them. When you play fast spell, slow spell, or skill, other allies will won. Challenger as well. Hmm. Hmm. This is a rather big predicament. So we're assuming that we're going to get... Shivana's going to hit fight, face. It doesn't really matter. Uh, Screeching's going to grab... What? 4-1? 6-5? 5-4? 6-5? 4-1? Screeching kills one of these. So Callista's definitely dead to rights. We could replay Callista. Be pretty happy about that. Um. So it's going to be, what? Merciless Hunter and Callista? Yeah, let's do Merciless Hunter, target Shiv, and then see what they do. Yes, this is correct. That makes sense. This all makes sense to me so far. We just need to redevelop though, and maybe just send it. Um, Yeah, I'm not going to block Shivana. It's not worth it. I'd rather just take the direct damage than lose a unit. So we can replay Callista and then open attack. That feels pretty good. If we open attack, that means they can't do Dragon Guard Lookout, they can't play another blocker. We just basically full send. We can also check the eyeball over here to see what we're going to get from Callista, and we are going to be getting that Buru Sentinel guy. So let's grab the Shivana with Callista, since Callista won't take damage, right? And then... Do like this. Do we even grab this? Grab with you? I think grabbing with you actually makes way more sense. Yeah, this is way better. Yeah. No, we can go this route. Let's go, Buru Sentinel. All right, what you got? Probably some kind of strike spell, I would assume. Yeah, single on the shiv. That's really interesting. Huh. Is there any world where we can Death Grasp? I don't think so. There's no good Death Grasp, right? This is worst case scenario. We don't want to do that. What if we do like this? That's also pretty bad. That does nothing for us. We never want to target him then. 
Yeah, I don't think there's like any targeting that we can do with Death Grafts to get us like out of this. We're best to just let this resolve as is, put them down to two. Our bonded ally takes that damage for Callista. We get a double trade. And our Nasus is kind of big. That's cool. I feel like getting him down now is actually fine. Breaching. Um. Yeah, we can play Nasus. He's a big boy. I don't think I want to play the Burgeoning Sentinel, to be honest. I kind of want to play out like Fading Icon and Cease the Sentry. We'll see, though. I don't really know. Latis. Deathless. Sir. Fading. Death Grasp. Easy peasy, right? And then Ceaseless. I guess we could have played her out. Then we'd have like a little bit extra damage, but hey, we got him. The next deck I have for you is going to be a little bit more expensive because it does require a champion we don't start off with, and that is Nidalee. We are also pairing her with Gnar from the Shrooms and Boons deck, so at least the second champion is one that we already have, so that's super nice, but it's going to be a pretty easy to craft deck after that. All the core components are commons and rares. There are no epics required in this list. This deck is really interesting because it's kind of like a newer archetype that was just introduced this year, and it's a little hard to understand if you haven't seen it yet. However, once you get into it and you understand like how to play out the mechanics, what the bush units are doing, what it all looks like, then you get used to it very quickly. And first we have Bristlehog, 1 mana 1 2, the first time an ally transforms, grant me 2 1. Transform effects include champion level up and level down, technically with Nara Nidalee, but also when you summon a unit out of a bush, that also counts as a transform effect, so Bristlehog is very reliably going to be a 1 mana 3-3. Three, three. And next we have Bird the Bellringer, 1 mana 2-1, when I'm summoned, plant a chime on the top card of your deck, and that's really good because the next time you draw a card, you're going to get a random plus 1 plus 1 to allies in hand, just a little bit of future value. Next we have Forsaken Bakai, 1 mana 2-1, play, predict. Predict shows you three cards from your deck, and then you pick one and it puts it on top of your deck, and the other two are shuffled in. That way you get to manipulate your deck and your draws. If you pick a Darken or an Equipment, grant me 1-1. One, one. Uh, I don't think we have any Darken or Equipment, so we're not going to get the plus one plus one. We're just using it as a consistency tool to make sure that we get our combo pieces. Next we have Double Pie Toss. We can use this to whittle down opponent strategies in the early game. Perilous Pastry comes in as well, being able to clear out some more 1 HP units, or we can reserve this for face damage later. Next we have Double Prowl. Prowl is cool. Burst Speed Spell. Give an ally plus 2 attack this round. If it is a bush, give it plus 2 plus 2. Next we have All Terrain Trooper. So now let's talk about the bush units in general and what the main mechanic of the deck is. So, uh, we're going to be playing units that have this keyword called Ambush. It's not really a keyword, it's more just like a, a phrase. And Ambush says, you can summon this card out of a bush for this cost. So what you do with the bush units is you always pay two mana to put them down as a bush, whether you're playing Trooper, whether you're playing Nidalee, whether you're playing Pyrophant, literally any of the bush units that have like this ambush word, you pay two mana and you put them down as a 2-2, no matter what their stats are. Then you pay their ambush cost to summon them as the unit, so he becomes a... Uh, basically at the end of the day, 2 mana, 3, 1. When I'm summoned or transformed, grant the weakest enemy vulnerable. This is the spell that you get in your hand to pull them out of the bush. So it's a bit weird. Again, if this is like your first time seeing the mechanic, it's really odd. I remember when the expansion came out and I was like, I just don't get it. I have to see it in person uh, to understand. And it can be a little confusing, but... Again, once you get it, it's super simple. Next we have Contrologist, a 2 mana 2 1 play. Manifest a spell from your regions that cost 3 or less. That's really good at just getting more resources, more removal cards. Contrologist is just a really strong card. Next we have another bush unit. This one is called Avenging Vestaya, so we pay 2 mana to put it down into bush form, and then we have to spend 3 mana to ambush it. So another thing that I didn't mention is that you can pay spell mana to summon the unit, so that's a little interesting thing. It's, it's a bit weird, but it's really, really cool. Another very important side note is you can only have one bush on the board at a time, so keep that in mind too, you can only have one. But yeah, so you pay three mana to summon this out as Avenging Vestaya. It says when I transform from Avenging Vestaya's Ambush, which is the spell, 
then you also get a right of negation type effect that says stop all enemy fast spells, slow spells, and skills. So if there's like a bunch of stuff on the stack, like let's say the opponent is shooting your face for six damage via triple mystic shot, you play Vestaya's Ambush, and then it will just negate all the spells. So this is really cool if the opponent commits a lot of spells or skills to a stack, you can just spend three mana to get a 3-3 body that's spell shield and also stop all of those. Next, we have Chief Knuckle Talk. He's a 3 mana 2 4 that says, When an ally transforms, fully heal it and also grant it plus 1 plus 1 in impact. So, you want to set Chief Knuckle Talk down early, and then whenever you summon units out of the bushes, they're going to gain extra stats. This effect also applies whenever your champions level up or level down. Next, we have Double Quicksand. This is a good defensive tool. 3 mana burst speed spell. Given enemy minus 4 minus 0 or 2 enemies minus 1 minus 0 and also disable their positive keywords. So this can help take away elusive and it can help take away overwhelm and stuff like that on top of helping you during combat. Next we have two wallop to slow down opponent strategies make it to where they can't do any attack effects. You can stop like elusives from hitting you other stuff like that just a really good defensive tool. Next we have Nar, our first champion. Quick attack. Also on strike, create a pokey stick in hand or if you already have one reduce its cost to zero which is super nice. And then we can use that to hit the enemy nexus or ping off units, draw, all kinds of good stuff. So, round end, level up if you've damaged the enemy nexus this round. On level up, he's going to get the knuckle talk buff if you have knuckle talk on the board, which is super cool. But he's going to be quick attack now with overwhelm. And also he grants the strongest enemy vulnerable. That way he can manipulate combat and punch overwhelm damage through something on the opponent's board. And then he levels down round end after your attack turn is done, meaning he will get another knuckle talk buff when he levels down. And next we have Nidalee. Nidalee is another ambush unit. So what you can do is you can pay two mana to put Nidalee down into bush form as a 2-2. And then you spend two mana to summon her out in unit form, which is really sick. She's a 5-3 with quick attack and she levels up if she's seen you summon or transform for other allies. And then she becomes pack mother Nidalee. She now gains overwhelm just like Nar and a Nexus strike effect. Transform me back into Nidalee and create a javelin toss in hand. So she's going to go back to her 5-3 form and give you a Javelin. Javelin is a fleeting slow speed spell that says deal 4 to an enemy. If there are no enemies when I'm played, I target the enemy Nexus instead, dealing 4 direct damage. That's just like really strong, especially since it's free. You do have to make sure you play it the turn that she levels down and just get some extra damage in that way. Next we have Valley of Imitation. Now this is another like pretty complicated card at first, but once you get into it, it makes a lot of sense. When you play a follower, transform me into a copy of it this round, I retain granted buffs. So what you want to do is play Valley right on turn 4, and then on turn 5, play like Knuckle Talk, and then Valley of Imitation will become another copy of Knuckle Talk. Since this counts as a transform, Knuckle Talk will buff itself, and then the one that comes from Valley will also buff itself, and it will keep those buffs for later, so currently a plus 2, plus 2, and impact. Then you want to play like another Knuckle Talk on 6, something like that, and then you want to play Big Game Tycoon on 7, and then you want to play Pyrophant later. And finally, here's the guy we were just talking about. Here's Big Game Tycoon, 7 mana 5, 6, play. Manifest a card with Ambush. We're usually looking for Pyrophant. That's like the ideal one. When an ally transforms, double its power and health. This is why the unit that's being transformed from Valley of Imitation is doubling. So it's really, really cool. You get really strong really fast. All of a sudden, you just have like a big 30 to attack dude, and it looks really funny. I've seen other iterations of this deck also run Aurora Halunatus, really strong ambush card, so that's really cool if you want to play more aggressive. And here's also the Towering Pyrophant if you want to hard run it. Normally we're just going to manifest it from Big Game Tycoon because we're shown three ambush cards. So we're going to see Pyrophant pretty often, so we're going to usually like create it. However, you can run it if you have the extra epic and you want the more consistent uh, Pyrophant finishes. And that's it for the deck rundown. Now here's a live commentary game so you can see how it plays out. And for this example game, we're fighting Elder Dragon Volibear. So they're going to be playing slow. They're going to ramp up their mana and try to get out big dudes. We have Nidalee. We have Knuckle Talk. I don't think we need Pytoss in this matchup. We probably don't need the Prowl either. So we're going to go ahead and mulligan away those. Try to find Valley of Imitation and multiple Knuckle Talks. That's actually really good. So we can do like a Knuckle Talk on turn five after Valley and then another Knuckle Talk on six. And then Big Game Tycoon on seven, which is perfect. And then try to win on turn eight. So let's go ahead and grab, we can do bird, we can do trooper. Mm, we're gonna do a third knuckle talk, which is just way too extra. We don't need to do that. I'm down to get the trooper or the bird. Let's grab trooper. Swing. Oh, we can also wall up Volley Bear when he comes down. So that's good.
Invocation of Thunder. Draw one, summon a sigil. Okay. Just a little sigil makes one of their bigger dudes one mana cheaper. That is no problem. I'm kind of down to play out Nidalee as a bush. So we're going to spend two mana to put her into bush form. Then we can spend two mana next turn to just summon her out as Nidalee, which is super sick. Alternatively, something else we can do is set up Nakotok and then do Nidalee later. That should be fine since she doesn't die to Avalanche right now. So they could play a 2-3. Let's go ahead and just open attack before they play anything. Because they could have the 3 mana 2 3 body. I don't want to attack into that. Yep, that's the one. And then play Knuckle Talk here. Hey, we could really go all in and just do a full setup and. Oh, there's Valley. I was about to say, never mind. We're doing something new. Enrage Fire Spitter. Okay. That's a very fast Fire Spitter. Turn 4. That's pretty epic. Hmm. You think it's going to grab my bush? It probably is, isn't it? Nah, they probably want to grab my knuckle talk. A bush might not be worth it for them. Let's see what they're grabbing. If they grab my bush, Nidalee's just going to kill them. Yeah, it's Nako. Makes sense. Um, Yeah, I want to pass because I want to play Valley this turn. We do miss out on some Nidalee power because knuckle talk died, but I really want to play Valley. It's kind of super important right now. And then we play Knuckle Talk first action. So check this out. Knuckle Talk. Boom. And then Valley becomes Knuckle Talk. So now we have a 4 6 landmark essentially. Wild Mysticism. That makes sense. Um, sure. And then we can get Nidalee out here and attack with her. We, we spent two mana to get her out of the bush, and she is a 7 5 with double impact, which is very strong. Um, yeah, ship that out. Bonk. And then it turns back into the valley, but it does maintain the buffs that we had from Knuckle Talk, which is really interesting. We can also get the uh, extra bonuses from Bristle Hog, can't we? So we should play that first. And we'll have a really big Bristle Hog. And we need to protect it with Wallop in case they try to swing into it. Because that's another side note if your Valley Imitation unit dies. It, uh, it goes away. Um, sure. Crystal Hog, let's go. 6-6 six, six with triple impact. That's pretty nifty. Mm -hmm. Goodbye, Nidalee. Oh, I get to keep the Bristle Pog. Interesting. I'm kind of down to wall up this, keep Nidalee alive. Yeah, we can't do any trade up here because it's tough. So, this is just good enough. And then I want to play Forsaken Bakai and try to find Big Game Tycoon first turn 7. No, we have Gnar instead. Okay. Kind of chilling with Gnar, that's fine. We level Nidalee this turn. So... What I kind of want to do is play this as a bush first. When you play a follower, transform me into an exact copy of it. Mm. Bush. My pack, die by my All right. Now we can buff the bush with Prowl. We're also gonna play Nar here. Fire Spitter number three. Wow, they just opened every Fire Spitter, I guess. Sounds good to me. So as a response to our bush dying, what we can do is just play zero mana, summon the unit from the bush, and we got the vulnerable that way. All right, now we can do seven, six to two, two. I'm kind of fine with that. That way we don't kill our bush because they could block it. Eight, six goes in. Um, a 3-3 three, three goes in. You know what? I'm about to send it. I'm about to send everything. To be honest, I'm about to just send it. Because depending on their block, we can clean something up with the javelin, you know? Wow! Or we can just threaten lethal right now with Nidalee's Prowl. Plus 2 damage on our Overwhelm unit. And that should be exact lethal here. 
yeah, we win because our impact stacked up. We got impact here. It was the Knockletox, man. They're so good. And the last deck I have for you is a classic that's been in the game for quite some time, and that is Lurk. This one is definitely going to be the most expensive of the three. However, it's just been like such a solid deck for so long that I kind of just have to cover it. It's not like for super, super new players. Just like Nidalee, this is probably more once you get used to the game a tiny bit and then you have like a segue to intermediate decks. I think Lurk is basically that. There are six unique champions you're going to have to craft. That is the three Rek'Sai's and the three Pikes, and there is an Epic as well, making this one definitely the most costly. The only thing to be wary of is that rotation is happening in March, so a lot of players are assuming that Lurk is going to get rotated. So if you're seeing this from the future, then this deck is probably no longer playable. So um, that's okay. We'll make another three decks for beginners video when the time comes, right? Cross that bridge when we come to it. But for now, Lurk is actually a really, really solid deck. So what this deck wants to do is attack with units and then have Lurkers on top of the deck. It's really, really important that our next card on top is a Lurker card. And when we do that, Lurker allies everywhere gain ramping attack. So we're going to start with like these little fishes that are one or two attack. And then we're going to ramp them up to like six attack fishes just by attacking over and over while we have a Lurker on top each time. In order to do this, we have predict cards that basically let us pick what's going to be on top. So we pick Lurker allies and then we attack getting the guaranteed Lurk procs. And because of this, we want to have most of our deck be Lurkers. I'm only running five non-Lurk cards and they are predict synergy cards, allowing us to have extra consistency. But it does suck when these end up being on top of the deck when you are attacking because they are not Lurkers. So we have Bloodbait here, one mana burst speed spell. It is a Lurk card. Create a Snapjaw Swarm on top of your deck. Snapjaw Swarm lets you start a free attack on defense turns, which is super nice. Next we have Forsaken Bakai, one mana to one predict. If you pick a dark in our equipment, grant me one one. Just like the last deck, we want to use Forsaken Bakai as a consistency card, but it's really, really important in this deck because we want to have certain cards on top. Next we have Sharkling, here's one of our fishes, one mana one two with Lurk. Here's what it says right here, when you attack while I'm on top of your deck, I Lurk. Granting Lurker allies everywhere, plus one, plus zero, max once per round. That's an important little side note, you cannot proc Lurk multiple times. However, there's a way to cheat extra Lurk damage, and that is through Rek'Sai. Next, we have Xersai Hatchling, a one mana, one, one with Fearsome and Lurk. Really good, really aggressive, hard to block. Next, we have Aspiring Chronomancer, two mana, two, three, play Predict. Just like our Forsaken Bakai, we want to have Chronomancer as well for the Predict Synergy. Next we have Call the Pack. This is a really, really cool card that actually like fixes a lot of the problems that Lurk has as an archetype. It is a Lurk spell that says, to play, put a card from hand on top of your deck and create two random Lurkers in hand. So it's doing two things here. One, it's taking a card that's already in your hand, like a Lurker or a Champion, putting it on top so that you can attack and get the Lurk proc, but also you're getting two additional cards in your hand to play with. So honestly, it's just like a do everything card. It helps some of your hands where you have a bunch of champions because you actually don't want champions in your hand. You want them to be in your deck. So if you do end up with a champion or two in your hand, you can use Call the Pack to fix your hand entirely, creating like a really increased consistency factor to the deck. It's really cool. Next, we have Redfin Hammer Snout, a very strong early game lurker. Two mana, one, two. Play, grant an enemy vulnerable so you can hit early game champions and stuff like that or high priority units and then kill them with your one and two drops. Next we hard run Snapjaw Swarm, I start a free attack for the most part, we want to be doing this on defense turns, that way we're proccing Lurk on our attack, and also on our defense. Next we have Rek'Sai, she's a 3 mana 3-6 three, Lurk, when I Lurk or attack, grant Lurker allies everywhere an additional plus 1 plus 0, so on top of your regular Lurk, you get another plus 1, so it's basically double dipping on the attack stat, and that gets really really insane really fast. Round end, place me into your deck. So if you play Rek'Sai and attack with her, she will just go back into your deck round end. That's why she's so strong. She has really good stats. However, you cannot play her early mid unless you're okay with her going back to the deck. The way you keep her on the board is attacking with 10 plus power. So if you have Rek'Sai and you play her as 8 and then you attack, she will lurk and then also give another plus 1. So that's plus 2. That puts her to 10. So you're good to go once you have Rek'Sai at 8 as long as you are lurking and then she will level and become a big overwhelm finish for you not only that but when she levels up she creates three random lurkers in your hand so basically you dump your entire hand and then get it all back for leveling rexai and next we have zersai collar three minute two three play predict that's all it does so it's just like the aspiring chronomancer and the forsaken bakai but also a lurk synergy card so just more predict which is super good because we want to have those consistent hands 
Next, we have Blood in the Water, 5 minutes slow speed spell. It's a Lurk spell. Deal 1 to anything, then Rally, allowing you to attack again. So if you have a bunch of big fishes out and you have Rek'Sai, well, you get to deal 1 and then attack a second time, basically making it to where if the opponent just barely lives the block, well, then you get to swing again and just kill the opponent. It's really strong for Lurk to have a Rally mechanic that also deals 1. So you can use that 1 to finish off the opponent's Nexus, or you can kill like a 1 HP unit that barely survived combat, and then push all your dudes again. And next we have another champion, Pike. 5 mana, 1-3 with uh, Quick Attack. When I Lurk, transform me into Death from below. This is really important. So when you put Pike on top of the deck, like via Predict, or he just ends up being there and you Lurk him, he actually becomes a spell. He's not a unit anymore. He becomes a spell that costs 5 that says Summon Pike Striking an Enemy. One-sided strike, by the way. He does not take any damage back. So however much you've lurked, like let's say you've lurked three times, he's going to be a 4-3. He will come down dealing four to something and just being a 4-3 body on top of that, allowing you to attack with him or block with him if you want. Just like really, really strong. So what you want to do is get Pike spell in your hand just so you have it to try to kill some of your opponent's high priority units while you uh, continue developing your lurkers. He levels up if allied pikes have dealt 15 damage via the spell or also just attacking and blocking. Then he does his really cool chain killing thing from League. So when I kill an enemy, I strike the weakest enemy. That's what he does in level 2 form. If he strikes that enemy and kills it, he will strike the next weakest and then kill that one and then strike the next weakest. If he kills that one, he keeps going. And it's really sick. You almost never see this though, so don't like fully try to play around pike spell. Most of the time the games end before you can get pike level and even if you do the opponent surrenders immediately. But there will be some times where you get this off and it does feel really cool. Next we have our epic here, Zerseret the Under Titans of 5 mana 2-6. Attack if I have 8 plus power, give me Fearsome, Overwhelm, and Spell Shield this round. So he's just like a really big 1 card win con, just a big dude. If you've got the opponent down to like 8 HP, then he's going to send it. If you have multiple Zerserets, great. Just a really strong mid-game win con to play around. And rounding us out, we have Zerside Dune Caller. This one's more simple. It's just an Overwhelm dude. He's a 6 mana 3-5. Just a big dude. So if you have like a couple Zerserets and a Zerside, you can close out the game that way pretty easily. Some players get really dizzy with this deck and play like more non-lurk cards like they triple down on the Aspiring Chronomancer with the Forsaken Bakai and they also run things like Rite of Negation and Quicksand and sometimes even Ruthless Predator which is just so crazy to run that many non-lurk cards. But hey, if you high roll, so be it. This is just going to be like a nice, simple, and consistent version of the deck to help you get into the archetype. And that's it for the deck rundown. Now here's a live commentary game so you can see how it plays out. And for the example game, we're going to be fighting Lucian, Vayne, Senna. Finally playing Lucian and Senna in the same deck, am I right? Very cool. So we can actually keep Call the Pack and Rek'Sai. For the most part though, what we want to do is hard mulligan for a 1 and 2 drops. I actually don't think this is worth keeping because the rest of our hand is so weird. If we saw like double 1 drops here, we could probably keep this and be very happy, but we're not happy right now with this. There we go, that's more like it. Sharkling on 1, Chronomancer on attack 2, and we got the Call of Pack Rex side back, so it's just perfect. Another really important thing to keep in mind when you are playing Lurk, every time that you don't attack on odds, you should probably like email Riot and flame them, because the deck is a lot worse when attacking on evens, which whenever I play Lurk, especially for like my meta report videos and stuff, and when I play on my own time, I always attack on evens, I don't know why, I guess it's a curse. I've already emailed Riot many times, they, uh, they won't get back to me though. Alright, so let's go ahead and we can get this vulnerable, or we can try to go for a guaranteed Lurk proc. Yeah, let's go ahead and play Chronomancer on attack 2 and predict it up. We want to hit Rek'Sai here. Now Rek'Sai is going to double dip and give us plus 2 for our Lurkers. Check this out, ready? We're Lurking, that's a plus 1, and then Rek'Sai effect. And just like that, our Shark is already a 1 mana 3 2 instead of a 1 2. Alright. So they're playing challengers and they're playing equipment. Makes sense since they are playing Dane. The awkward thing is now we're on like a double Rex I hand, which is a bit weird, but it's all good. I'm with Knight. And a Senna. What I want to do is probably give Senna vulnerable. And then next turn we do call the pack Rex I, right? So we can double dip and get more Rex I procs going. So I kind of just want to do that. I could also predict this turn, but that doesn't do a lot since we won't be able to lurk it. I kind of just want to get vulnerable then. I think this makes the most sense. And then we'll let Senna hit us. And Tracker's probably going to grab one of the sharks, whatever. We can also block here. And to be honest, I'm really not opposed to blocking like this. 
and they only have Senna left? Yo, I like that. I'm down to just like trade the board because they're going to end up blocking us anyways. All I'm doing is preventing damage and allowing our other attackers to go through. Since they're playing a board centric deck, I think that's just right. So let's go ahead and do call the pack, target Rek'Sai. Do we have any more lurkers to play? We do. We don't want to play predict though. That would be really bad. We could play our own Rek'Sai and just like triple dip. And then our next Rek'Sai is going to level on attack, what, six? That's pretty broken. Yeah, that's, that's pretty good. We could just play Rek'Sai here. Yeah, let's do that. <laughs> that's better than playing a predict unit. Yikes. And we want to save Snapdrops 1 for defense turn. Let's go ahead and use Rek'Sai to trade up into Senna, right? And then 2-1 to also send. I guess it doesn't really matter how we do this, like at all, because we're just going to end up losing our Chronomancer. I think this is better though, because they have to sack the fading instead of chump blocking with the 0-1. Yeah, this is better then. Let's do this attack. Yeah, this is just disgusting. This is just like a high roll lurk game. I feel kind of bad. Sometimes we're cringe, it is what it is, right? Because on turn 6, we can play Xerxai Caller to guarantee a Lurk proc, and we can also play Rek'Sai. And then that's... I guess we just win on 6, I don't know. Sometimes you high roll. Yo, I can do you one better. Another thing we can do is Caller this turn, and Snapjaw Swarm. Mark? Yeah, they're tilt playing. Good job, Mark of the Isles. Alright. There's a collar, and we can target anything. It really doesn't matter. Call the pack's fine. Snapjaw Swarm, start a free attack on defense turn. That will lurk. They have to block it. It's another Senna, yeah. And then we just win by a lot. Now we play Zersai Collar, predict. Let's find Pike. Ah, oh, let's go, I called it. <laughs> And then we play Rek'Sai and we win the game. Right on turn 6. Very aggressive hand. I just had like a turbo Rek'Sai hand. No, don't you capture me. No! Wait a minute. They have the one out. I've never seen Demacia Tellstones resolve in my life. We're still in it, lads. We're still in it. Ain't no way. Whatever, we have Pike spell, so we can kill whatever comes out. Vayne, very cool. Give me back my Rek'Sai, you fiend. Rek'Sai's gonna go back to my deck, though. A bit awkward. No, Rek'Sai, don't leave me, please. I can change. Don't leave me, Rek'Sai. Huh. Uh, okay. Haha, <laughs> that sounds about right. We basically won last turn if they weren't so mean and detained me. And that's it for Sharima. Extra shout out to the patrons on screen. Much love and thank you for supporting. So for some closing thoughts, Nasus being the only Sharima champ that new players start with is so awkward, especially since I already covered a deck for him in the Shadow Isles video, but we made it work. Nidalee coming in clutch as well with the package being primarily commons and rares is super magical. Honestly, Lurk is a classic too, but be careful, again, because it could be getting rotated in 3 months. I know it's a little far off, but just keep it in mind. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to drop a sub if you're new, and also a like for the algorithm. That way other new players can see this video. Thank you so much for watching, and have a good one. Laters.